Great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be back in Valley Halbert. And it's always interesting, interesting to notice changes that uh, happen to the place. And I've noticed you've got yourselves a wee lamp up here. <laughs> I'm very impressed with it. So it helps me to see a wee bit better. Now, can you take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8? The last couple of times I was with you, we were thinking about dead flies. Well, we're going to leave the flies alone. And the whole idea about the dead flies, those carnalities that can get into our relationships and take away the unity and uh, leave behind division. Uh, but we can think of those dead flies in other forms and other ways and... Uh, we can do that at other times. But here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And if you go down to verse 12. Now the context is about meat being offered to idols. And meat that had been used in pagan worship. Should you take that meat and just eat it? Or, or would that be defiling? That was the big issue. And the believers, they would discuss it, they'd debate it, their arguments about it, they'd fall out about it. So the right, the Apostle Paul say, Paul, could you sort it out for us? Uh, the meat that's been used in idol worship, can we eat it or, can, or should we leave it alone? That was the issue. And Paul, from verse 1 right through, he's been arguing a particular perspective on it. He says... There's nothing wrong with the meat. Uh, he says, I, I can eat it with a clear conscience and so can you. But then he draws a conclusion to the whole thing. And he says this. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend I will eat no flesh, while the world is standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So Paul is simply saying, uh, there's nothing wrong with the meat. I can eat the meat with a good clear conscience and enjoy it. But he says, if doing so offends my weaker brother, he says, I'll not eat the meat. Because there's a higher value and that is, I don't want to wound my brother in the Lord. I don't want to wound my brother in the Lord. We're going to think about scars and wounds. See, there are some wounds in life you can discard. That's just life. I've got a big old scar here. To my right side, I dismiss it. It's just life as we lad at the time. I took appendicitis, they dragged me off to the hospital and they cut it out, sewed me up again and they left behind a scar. I just dismissed that, that's just life. But I have a scar there on the left knee and it was caused. It should never have happened. See, way back in my childhood, I learned a lot of DIY skills that uh, have helped me even today. Because way back in those days, you see, no money about the place. You had to make your own toys, your own transportation. You couldn't afford to buy a bike. Uh, so you made uh, bows and arrows and uh, uh, swords, uh, slings and uh, catapults, all weapons of war. See? Against the kids in the other street. You need to fight them to defend yourself. So you had to use your DIY skills to make the weapons of war. And when it came to transportation, we used to make guiders. You may call them box carts. I don't know what you call them, but to us they were guiders. Just an old onion box screwed to a big plank. And then there's another bit of wood this way and another wood uh, at the back. And uh, bits of iron and you'd cannibalize uh, prams, take the wheels off them and there'd be your wheels. And my big brother and myself, we made our guider and... The problem was, it only has three wheels. 
So it wasn't going to be a very, you know, steady vehicle. And how you steered it was, you used your feet for a bit of string at the front, and that's the way you steered it. And my big brother, well, he got into it, and he was going to steer the thing, and I was the engine. I was also a braking mechanism. I had to push him and hold him back, going around the corner and so on. And, well, Ronnie lost control, and he crashed the thing. And this bare axle that didn't have the wheel on it, I ran into it, and it left a big gash up the knee. There were tears, there was agony, there was blood, and eventually there were stitches and a scar for life. So I know this to be deeply wounded. And the question is, you see, those wounds, who caused them? Who do you blame for them? I, I, I dismiss the scar here. I, I don't have any bitterness against the surgeons. They, they cut me and they took the appendix out. They were a blessing to me. They saved my life probably. So they were, those were heroes. But that now, guys on the knee and all the blood and all the pain, someone is responsible for that. It was my big brother Ronnie. <laughs> Now, the last time when we talked about the flies, it was uh, vengeance and retaliation. Uh, and, and back then, you know, my big brother, yes, he taught me how to kick football and played marbles, uh, but he was also responsible for the guys on my knee. He caused that. He wounded me. I do remember a time when the opportunity did come along for a wee bit of revenge and retaliation. And it was when he had just passed his driving test. And of course, back in those days, the young fellas who had just passed their driving test, the whole purpose of it all was to impress the girls. And, and uh, Ronnie used to, on a Saturday night, especially a Friday night, he, he would try to sneak the car and drive around the town with one hand. He thought the girls were impressed by seeing uh, him driving around with one hand, you see, uh, girls were as foolish as he was probably <laughs> and, and they were impressed by this what a fella he can drive with one hand just one idiot admiring another idiot but uh, that's the way so he was always trying to sneak the car now as far as my dad was concerned he owned the car, paid for the car I paid the petrol in the car well the car's only to get from A to B for, with purpose um, there has to be, you know, there has to be a reason for driving the car. And, and to drive around the car, the, the, the town of the one hand, that, that, that's not a reason for driving the car, that's idiocy. You don't drive the car for that. But I remember this uh, Friday night, it was rather late, and my dad was in bed, but Ronnie was out in the town, as it were, and uh, not, not, not having the car. I, and I lived at the front, or in my bedroom, the front of the house, and I thought I heard something, so I peeked through, and there was my brother Ronnie stealing the car. And back in those days, you see, you could steal a car very easily if you had a metal comb to get the corner of it, and that was enough to open the door and get you in, and you used the same thing to turn the ignition. There's no safety of the cars whatsoever, no security. Anybody could steal it. And my brother had the door open and he was slowly pushing things down to the bottom of the street before he got in and turned the ignition and off he went. And I saw this and I thought of this gnash on my knee and I thought of all the time being up my backside in the bed that we shared together. This was my chance for revenge and retaliation. But then when I thought about it, if I did tell my dad he could get himself in serious trouble. He'd never be allowed to drive the car again. So I decided, as much as it was difficult to do, I would not seek my revenge or retaliation. I wouldn't allow a root of bitterness to get into my heart against my brother. My brother wounded me. He hurt me. And you see the day when he died and we buried him, and when we carried the coffin past the old street and all those memories came back, I remember tapping the coffin and saying, Ronnie, I was glad I never got you into trouble. 
I was glad I never allowed a root of bitterness to develop in my heart. I was glad I always had an affection for you because you're always my brother. See, brothers, we can hurt one another. And here's the wee lesson that I want to show you again here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Look what it says in verse 12. He says, And when you sin so against the brethren, when you dismiss their interest and their feelings and how they think and so on, if you dismiss them and hurt them, he says, When you so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That's a different dimension to it, isn't it? So if I allow a root of bitterness to develop in my heart against my brother and seek revenge and retaliation, I'm not just sinning and hurting them, I'm wounding the Christ that died for me. Boy, that's some deterrence here on. I can't do that to my brother. I can't say it against my brother because if I wound my brother by what I say and what I do against them, I'm wounding the Christ that died for me, and I can't do that to the Lord Jesus. I can't wound him who was wounded for me. But brothers, we can wound one another. Um, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Now, of course, there's many marvellous stories in the Bible of Kith and Ken who hurt each other. Uh, we have looked in the past of Leah and Rachel, two girls, two sisters. And, uh, you know, they could have been allies together and be a blessing one to the other, but the Bible says they wrestled with each other. They became a, a torture struggle with one another. They spent a lifetime just hurting one another because of jealousy and because of pride. Here we are in Psalm 55. And the beginning of the psalm, he talks about how he feels abandoned by God. And then he begins to talk about how he was abused by his fellow man, by those around him. And things get, look at verse 4, he says, My heart is pain within me. This is a wounded man. Oh, the, the wounds don't bring blood. Uh, the, the wounds are inside emotional, psychological, spiritual, and deep-seated wounds, in, uh, wounds inside his heart. He says, my heart is pained within me. This is a wounded man. Who's caused these wounds? Well, he tells us how he feels. He says in verse 6, And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. Then would I fly away and be at rest. He just wants to get away from the pain, from the, from the, the agony of the wounds within him. He wishes he could just be like a, a dove and develop wings and fly away and, and find a place of rest where he can put the troubles behind him. And who it was that caused the troubles. Look at what he says in verse 12. Was it the Philistines that caused these wounds? Was the Amalekites, uh, who's he pointing the finger at, who's he blaming, who's he say caused the pain and the agony, who is that hurt him? He says, for it was not an enemy. Oh, this inner pain and agony I feel, he said, I'm not pointing a finger at the Philistines or pointing a finger at the, the Amalekites. They didn't cause this inner turmoil and heartache and agony of my soul. It wasn't them. It wasn't an enemy. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. He says, then I could have borne it. He, he's got a, an agony and a pain, a wound, and he can't bear it. He says, if my enemy had caused it, I could have borne it much easier. But he says, the source of my pain is not my enemy. Somebody else. Neither was it he that hated me. But then he goes on to say, verse 13, But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, 
And we walked under the house of God in company. You know who he's talking about? He's talking about a fella called Ahithophel, one of his chief advisors. He feels betrayed by him. See, all oh, this in the context of David being the king of Israel and his son Absalom raises against him and rebels against him and tries to seize the throne of him. And Ahithophel, he betrays David and he takes the side of Absalom. He's betrayed by his brother in arms, as it were. It was a betrayal by his chiefest account counselor. In other words, betrayed by his brother. See, brothers could hurt one another. Uh, you know the story of uh, uh, this big fella, Esau, and he stands there with the father. And all of his life he knew the day would come when the inheritance would be his. He got the farm and the animals and uh, the, the servants and the authority and the money and the, the bank account and the chariots and the garage. He'd have it all. And he's standing there, a broken man in tears. He's lost it all. And he says, Father, is there not even a penny in the bank for me? Is there not a crumb on the table for me? And the father says, Son, there's nothing left for you. It's been stolen under your eyes. Who? He says, your brother Jacob. Say, brothers can do that one to the other. That's why the scriptures time and time again emphasize to love one another, be kind to one to another, let it be tender hearted one to the other, be gracious, all these kind of uh, virtues one for the other, to love each other, not to wound and to hurt one another. Because when we do that to one another, we do it against the Christ that died for us. So we can wound one another. The wounds can come from one that we took sweet counsel with, we went to the house of the Lord with, we broke bread with, and then they end up at the end of the day betraying us in some way and wounding us, breaking our hearts. But that's where break, where wounds can come from. It can come from our brother. But of course it can come from other sources as well. I want you to take your Bible and turn this time to... Uh, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 15. John's Gospel, chapter 15. John's Gospel, chapter 15, and go down to verse 18. And uh, the Lord Jesus, speaking to the disciples, this is what he says. Uh, verse 17, he says, These things I command you, that you love one another. <laughs> Just tie it on to what we've already said. It's a commandment we, that we love one another. And if you love one another, you don't wound one another. Uh, and then he just reminds us, and there's a good reason why we should love one another. Because we're in a world that's going to hit us. There should be love on the inside because there's so much hatred on the outside. And he says this. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So Jesus says, look, you belong to one another. Love each other. Because outside the fellowship of discipleship and believers, there's a world out there and they're going to hit you. They're going to find ways to wound you. Then Jesus elsewhere, he says, I'm going to send you out in that world out there and it's going to be a world where you're going to be sheep surrounded by wolves. And we are fortunate if for a long time, and maybe for a long time the wolves have been rather uh, gracious to us. They've recognised we're believers, it's their world, but they've left us alone for most of the time. But we're living in a world today where the wolves are howling against us. And they're finding ways to hate us 
and to express their hate and to show their hate and even to begin to bite us. Maybe the root cause of it is that Jesus Christ is our Lord. The Word of God is His Word. And we want to live in this world and follow the Word of God. And our values come from the Word of God. And we're discovering that the values of the Word of God are now clashing with the values of a secular, godless world. And if there's going to be a tug of war and there's going to be a clash, you can be sure that the world is going to find ways to hurt us because of our values. We had a Christian charity in Northern Ireland. And their particular sphere of ministry is toward the world of transgenderism. If there's a young person who feels born a boy, but they feel they're a girl, and they want sort of counselling in that, well, they're there to help them to, you know, to talk about those things. The, the bank where they had their account shut their bank down just because of their ministry. And, uh, of course, it went through the court system and, thankfully, uh, they won their case. And they got £30,000 compensation for the bank was not entitled to shut down their account because of what they believed in the nature of their ministry. But it goes to show you the world we live in and, and even the banking system is now saying, if your values are not in line with their secular values, we can shut down your bank account. And sure, it's just this last week or two, Nigel Farage has exposed the whole thing. And what's been going on in a secular world out there that has their secular values and are going through all of our social media accounts and what we say and what we believe to find out whether we can still bank with them. One vicar in England. And uh, he was asked to do a survey in his bank. And he says, absolutely, I'll... I'll do a wee survey for you. And they asked him if there's anything uh, uh, he want to say about uh, being a customer of the bank. And he says, well, my local bank, every time I go into it in Pride Week, uh, it's, fest, uh, it's sort of overdone the whole thing about uh, Pride Week and transgenderism. And he just had a wee complaint about it. It's just overblown and overdone. They shut down his bank account. So they don't want your account. See, that's uh, a secular world where the wolves are in control and the wolves are beginning to howl and let us know that it's their world. They set the boundaries and they control the laws. They make the laws. They codify their values in law and at times we as believers may find ourselves outside their codified laws. And the big, big challenge for us as believers living in this world today is how we respond to that and how we react to it. You remember Peter? And Peter says, Lord, I am the best disciple you have. If you tell us they're going to take you to Jerusalem and they're going to arrest you and they're going to nail you to a cross, I'll go to jail for you, I'll die on a cross for you, I'm the man. But of course, when all those things began to happen, <laughs> when the wolves howl, and the wolves came against the Lord Jesus and nailed him to a cross. Where was Peter? Oh, Peter thought, hey, I better just keep my head down. And when the wee girl says, are you not one of that man's disciples? He said very clearly, I know not that man. I got me mixed up with somebody else. He just wanted to avoid the trouble. And as believers living in this world, a world that can wound us, you know, we don't want to fight. We don't want arguments, we don't want debates, we just want to meet together and believe what we believe and share what we share. And, and we just want to be left alone as it were. But we've got to understand, the world out there is a secular, godless world. And they can come against us and they can wound us. And our challenge when the time comes, what are we going to do? Keep a head down or keep a head above the parapet and say, this is who I am. 
This is the one who died for me upon a cross. He's my Lord. And this is his word. I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to hurt or hate anybody. I just want to believe what Jesus tells me is the truth. And if that means the world wants to come against me, well, I suppose either I can put my head down, talk out the fight, or I can say, well, if you want to wound me or hurt me, so be it. I stand for Christ. So, wounds, we can wound one another. Don't do that. Because if you wouldn't want another, you're just wounding the Christ that died for you. And you live in a world out there that's going to find other ways to wound us because they hate us. So love one another. Living in a world that hates us. Let's close with a word of prayer. And we'll just end for now. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his death upon the cross. And through that death we have come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the fellowship of believers. Father, help us to always remind ourselves that if we seek to wound one another, we are wounding the one who died for us. Father, give us the grace and the courage to live in a world that we feel more than ever is beginning to show its hatred for us. Not just to tolerate what we believe and who we want to worship and serve, but we want to silence us and if we're not prepared to be silenced, they'll find some way to wound us. Give us, our Father, the grace to bear the wounds of the world as we ask it in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. God bless you.